You're listening to Don't Waste Water. I felt that in the water sector, the way to have the biggest impact, it's not through restructuring, it's not through regulation, it's not through operations, it's through innovation. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. If you were a crook and you wanted to develop a business that was just sort of fooling people, and you were going to do it, you'd do it in a different industry. To be perfectly blunt, it's hard enough selling stuff into the water sector, even when your idea is brilliant, let alone try to sell it if it's rubbish. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm thrilled to welcome Pierce Clark as my guest. How do we make the water sector better at identifying and adopting innovations that could make it provide a better public health service to populations around the world. Pierce is the chairman and founder of Isle Utilities. The height of my career was leading a failed management buyout out of a dying PLC. Well done, Pierce. <laughs> Isle aims to bring new technologies to life by connecting expertise, investments and inspired ideas across the globe. I remember my first pilot as a young water professional. We were trying to enhance biogas production in a mid-sized wastewater treatment plant. To this date, I can't say if we failed because we indeed increased production, but yet probably not enough for the technology to be adopted. And in fact, it wasn't. In the next years of my career, I have again been involved in multiple pilots. Some of them were successful enough to take me abroad to conferences and present the results. But again, I must be really bad or doomed, but none of them ever became a full scale. And I honestly never took a step back to figure out what was wrong with piloting. I can just tell it's hard by experience, but also because so many of the about 100 guests that appeared on that microphone shared similar stories. So when I asked Sylvain Zamir by season 5 episode 15 what was the most exciting project she ever got involved in, and she answered that. The Isle Utilities Trial Reservoir Private Revolving Loan Fund to accelerate new technologies to market for me is one of the most exciting because I experienced that pain from the new technology provider side. And so to see a neutral third party come in and be a part of solving that for me is really exciting. I had to think, gosh, that's so brilliant, simple and desperately needed in this industry. I must find out more. And trust me, not only will we all find out more together with Pierce in just a minute, but I promise you will also have a good time listening to how he colorfully deploys the story. Are you ready to turn piloting on its head? Well, while you buckle up, let me remind you that if you like what you hear, you can help me up tremendously by sharing that content around you. Please tell your friends, colleagues, or LinkedIn network what you found inspiring in what Pierce shares today. And if you don't like what you hear, please reach out to me and tell me what I should be doing differently or better. Come on, do it, and I'll meet you on the other side. You're listening to Don't Waste Water, the podcast that helps water professionals to improve their wastewater treatment, optimize their operation costs, and keep up with the latest market trends. This podcast is brought to you by GS Piping Systems. As a leading supplier of piping systems made of plastics and metal, GF Piping Systems is the global expert for the safe and reliable transportation of water, chemicals, and gas. For more information, visit gfps.com. Hi, Pierce. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Antoine. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to that discussion and explore a bit all the word, because first, you were recommended quite a lot of times from different people. Second, you're on the top 40 list of the water technology power list. So I'm intrigued about that one. And uh, you're named as an influencer there with the remark that you're an irrepressibly engaging water tech connector. So that's also something I'd like to cover with you. But before all of that, I have traditions on that microphone and it starts with a postcard. And you're sending a postcard from Epson. What can you tell me about Epson, which I would ignore by now? So Epsom is a sort of market town about 10 miles south of the centre of London. And it's famous because it's got a race course here. It's got the Epsom Derby race course, which I live about 100 metres away from. So at the end of a long, hard day, my wife and I will go for a walk around the race course. And the thing about it is the really telling thing is the suffragettes. A hundred years ago, the suffragettes were the women's rights campaigners. 
And on one of them, one of the famous races, I think it was 1914 or 15, one of the suffragettes got onto the race course and tried to pin their flag onto the king's horse as it raced by. Unfortunately, they misjudged it and the horse ploughed into them and killed her. And Emily Davidson was her name and she actually died. I don't know why I'm laughing. She actually died about 150 yards away from where we live. And it's on this race course. So it's a very famous race course. And that is my postcard from Epsom, a race course that was an important part of the suffragette movement. Actually, the Epsom Derby was already mentioned once on that microphone, and that was by Paul O'Callaghan, who took that oh, analogy. And he was mentioning that if you are in, in innovation in the water industry, you shall pick the right horse in the right race with the right driver. So it sounds like There's a connection because those are as well fields which we might be reviewing today. So it's an interesting coincidence, I'd say. It is, isn't it? To start to, to go a bit through your path, I was just reviewing that path. And I thought that if you look at it backwards, it sounds like everything led to the inception of aisle utilities and everything was absolutely logical. And I do know that sounds oftentimes like a post-rationalization where you look at things and you think, Everything is logical, but while you're doing it, maybe it's not that straightforward. But in fact, you've started as a researcher, you've spinned out some of that research, you've been bringing that to market, you've been working on the capital side of things, you've been on the utility side. And I'm just wondering, what's your red thread and how will you describe that? So it's very nice of you to say that it all leads to this. I actually, I've had two fairly significant career bumps, which led me to where I am today. And at the time they happened, felt absolutely disastrous and you wondered whether there was a way forward. And yet now I look at them and see them as being critical moments that helped me become who I am today and doing what I do today. And like you say, I started life doing a science degree. I then did a PhD in civil engineering. I was very passionate about doing things in the water sector. And so I joined the water sector in particular in research because I felt that in the water sector, the way to have the biggest impact is in th is through innovation. It's not through restructuring. It's not through regulation. It's not through operations. I felt back in the early 1990s that the way I could have the biggest impact was through innovation. That was how I could make a, an every youngster, you kind of want to create a legacy. You want to do something that's going to resonate down the generations. And it was innovation that I wanted to be in. So I started working for a water company, Northwest Water. And after a couple of years there, I thought I need some international experience. So I joined an engineering consultancy called Atkins, W.S. Atkins. And I spent nine years at Atkins and I went from sort of head of research to commercial director to eventually managing director over that nine year period. And then I left Atkins and joined another consultancy, Mooshell, where I was now running a team of 3000 people. It was a 200 million turnover business. It was a big international consultancy doing sort of big projects. And if you'd asked me at that time what I thought my career progression was going to be, I probably would have said, I'm going to be chief executive of a big PLC, which is exactly where my sort of ego would have taken me. But I would have been a terrible chief executive. I would be a terrible chief executive of a big, complicated business. It's not the skill set I've got. But of course, I didn't have the wherewithal to understand that at the time. So the first career bump came in 2009 when there was an opportunity for me to buy out my business from Mooshell. So Mooshell is this very big engineering consultancy employing 10,000 or so people. I'm one of the three managing directors and I'm running a third of the business. And I'm basically given the opportunity to lead a management buyout. And so I spend four or five months going through a very detailed process of raising the money and trying to get this management buyout up and running. And on the 17th of December, 2009, not that these dates are burnt into my brain, but on the 17th of December, 2009, I sat down with the chief executive of Mooshell and we negotiated a deal. We shook hands on a deal. And if you'd said to me that evening, is this going to happen? I'd have said, hell yes. I've got the management team, I've got the money, we've got the vision, we've got the business plan, we've got everything in place. There's nothing that's going to stop this. And on the 18th of December, 24 hours later, there was a hostile bid made for the whole of Mooshell by Vosper Thornycroft. And my little management buyout 
died instantly. It was dead. It took literally 10 minutes for this deal, which had taken four or five months to create, to die. At that time, I didn't quite feel that it was a disaster. I thought, oh, well, never mind. I'll go back into Mooshell. I'd been taken offline because obviously I was conflicted. I was leading a management buyout. So I'd stood down from the, the executive board and I went back to be on the executive board. And two weeks later, I sat down again with the chief executive and said, you know what, this isn't going to work. I'm going to become a terrorist here. I've spent four months working out how I could do this business outside of Mooshell. And now you're asking me to come back in and I'm just not there. And so I left Mooshell and I formally left at the end of December 2009. I woke up actually on January the 1st, 2010, thinking it's a new decade. I'm 40. I'm out of a job for the first time in my career. The height of my career was leading a failed management buyout out of a dying PLC. Well done, Piers. <laughs> and at that stage, it really did feel like this was a pretty catastrophic place to be. I was 14. It was too long. I'd had this incredibly blessed career of sort of soaring through the ranks and being promoted way beyond my capabilities. And suddenly I found myself on the metaphorical scrap heap. Now, that was the burp number one. Shall I continue with burp number two? Well, yes, I want you to continue with burp number two, but it's interesting because you've made all that, that build up. And now you say that in retrospect, that story is a positive one. So it's interesting because it gives a hint at what you're building after that. Yeah. But yeah, well, I'd be interested to hear burp number two. So burp number two was, it's now January 2010. And I'm thinking, OK, well, I've got to find myself another job. And I'm very fortunate that the new chief executive at Thames Water rings me up and says, we need someone to come in and head our asset management team. It was 800 people. They were about to launch a billion pound a year capital program. They needed someone to sort of come in and get the team sorted. And I would originally thought, well, it's a six, eight week piece of work. Yeah, very happy to do it. And that's when Isle was created because Isle was the project name of the management buyout from Mooshell. Now, this is yeah. very childish, and any of your listeners aren't going to judge me on this, because we called it Project Isle because it's a play on words. So internally, people thought, oh, Isle. They called it Isle because it's about carving out the water and energy business to be a separate entity like an island. The truth of the matter was that I was just playing with the word projectile. So we took the word project and aisle and made it projectile. So that when the finance director said to me, ah, oh, Clark, tell me, how's project aisle going? We'd go, well, projectile is going incredibly well. And he never once picked up on the fact that we were calling it projectile. It was just this incredibly childish moment. Anyway, so the management buyout had died. Here I am in January. I've been asked to do some work in Thames Water. And the tax efficient way of doing it is to register a little business. And so I was formed because I went onto the company's house website to register a little business, a one man band business so that I could do a bit of consulting work. And I was going to call it Piers Clark Limited, because that's what you always do. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Isle is going to live on. And so I typed Isle into the company's house website and press send, bing, and I got an immediate rejection because there was already a business called Isle. There's some business in Scotland that's called Isle. So without a moment's thought, without any engagement at all, I called it Isle Utilities. Now, if I'd thought, I would have called it Isle Consulting or Isle Advisory, but no, I didn't think. I just typed Isle Utilities, bing, it got accepted, marvellous. And that has been the bane of my life for the last 10 years, because we aren't a utility. It's called Isle Utilities, and we aren't a utility. So we tend to call ourselves just Isle, just to be our trading name is Isle rather than our legal entity name. So Isle was formed in early 2010 as I was starting to do a what I thought was a very small piece of work with Thames Water. This two-month piece of work with Thames Water then actually extended and I ended up being the interim asset director at Thames for about 16 months. And I then left Thames and two days after I left, I was then asked to go back as the commercial director. And so I then rejoined Thames's exec board 
as their commercial director. So I had this slightly odd, and it was a truly odd experience because I left. I had a leaving do. You know, I genuinely had a leaving do on the Thursday night. I left on the Friday. On the following Monday, the chief executive of Thames Water rang me up and said, hey, we've been thinking about a commercial director. Do you want the post? I said, well, I left last week. You don't really want me to come straight back, do you? That would look a bit weird. He goes, well, you know, whatever. Why don't you come? And so I was... I literally left one exec meeting in, I think it was March 2011, and I was at the next exec meeting wearing a different hat as the commercial director in April 2011. I then had four wonderful years at Thames Water where I was the commercial director responsible for all of their non-regulated activities and all of the industrial clients, the hotels, the gyms, the factories, the industrial people. Just for me to understand that one, that means you create Isle. You expect it to be a six to eight weeks appointment with Thames Water and it ends up being four to five years you're working there. So how does that interact between your Thames Water yep. duties? It, was it a full-time job with Isle as a fake nose, if I might say so? When it first started, Isle was just me and I was just doing consulting for Thames Water. And I did that all the way through until I ceased being the asset director. When I joined as a commercial director, I was then employed by Thames Water. So for that first year, I was there. However, in that first year, the team at Mouchel, the previous business, Mouchel was going through a sort of unraveling. And there was an initiative that I'd started at Mouchel called the TAG, the Technology Approval Group Forum. And I rang the chief executive about six months after I left. And his name was Rich Cuthbert. He's a wonderful man. I said, Rich, you know, the TAG, I know it only employs three or four people, but it's the icing on the cake. In fact, it's the cherry on top of the icing on top of the cake. And you need to look after the tag process because that cascades. All the value that we generate in the consulting business is it cascades from that, that tag initiative. And he said, look, Piers, you don't know how hard it is here. We're going to have to make a lot of people redundant. And I, without a moment's thought, and you'll see that there's a thread here that I tend to do things without thinking them through. I, without a moment's thought, said, well, in that case, let me take them on. You know, TAG had been my baby. And I, to be perfectly blunt, I thought if anyone's going to kill TAG, I want it to be me. If it's going to <laughs> die on anyone's watch, I want to be the one that puts it to bed. And, uh, and so I said, you know, let me take these people on. There were only three people, Monica Stewart and Fiona. And I said, let me take them on. And he said, yes. I then rang my wife and said, ah, Stella, I think I've just gambled a quarter of a million pounds. Are we okay with that? Which was basically all of the income I was getting from Thames Water. I was now going to gamble on taking on these three people into this little consulting business. To put the timeline, just to understand that, you, you created a tag as part of Mouchel in 2005. Then you leave Mouchel, so tag leaves a bit without you, and then you take them back in 2011, 12. When is it that you integrate them into uh, Isle? 2010. So, 2010. yes, you're right. You're I, at the beginning of your Isle journey, you take those three people on board yeah. at the same time that you're working with Thames as it's your exclusive yeah, yeah. customer. And to be fair, at that time, I fully expected Tag to die. We had six UK water companies, and I thought, well, if we lose more than two of them, we're dead. And we're probably going to lose more than two of them because we've gone from being part of this big engineering consultancy to we're just this tiny little two men and a dog sort of business. We're going to struggle with procurement. Nobody's going to want to procure with a business that doesn't have any track record. But far better that it died under my watch than it died elsewhere was the logic I was working to. So, so that leads us to your blurb number two at some point. Well, so blurb number two came, I was with Thames. I had five wonderful years at Thames Water doing great things. And then in 2015, there was a fund, a new fund was being talked about by Blackstone, the world's most successful private equity fund. And I thought, well, hell, I've done quite well. I've, you know, I've done the consulting thing. I've done the water utility thing. I think I could become an investor, I thought. Yeah, my ego running ahead of me as I thought that I could become one of the world's great water investors. And so I heard about Blackstone forming this fund. It was going to be $7 billion, starting with a billion dollars sort of seed capital growing to $7 billion. And so I basically found the person who was in charge of this fund and I begged them for a job. My argument was very simple. It was 
Don't employ another banker. Employ someone like me who understands the water sector and has a great international connection. So it was a very simple pitch and all credit to them. They actually believed it. They gave me the job. And so I was appointed as the first managing director of the Blackstone Water Fund called Global Water Development Partners. And the first three months were just wonderful. It was great. My job was to find projects where Blackstone could invest $100 million dollars in water assets. It was quite expensive money, about 18% IRR. So that means you were looking at projects that have got sufficient risk inside them. So it was a very exciting time to be doing that. When you say project, is it companies? Is it like PPP projects, like assets? What kind of projects was it? All, all of the above, basically. It's everything from looking at desal plants to transferring assets over to PPP schemes to... There was a particular deal I was looking at, which was around green data centers, six green data centers in the UK. It was a nice sort of 400 million investment, 200 of debt, 200 of equity with 44, 45% IRR. So it was a really nice financial project. Anyway, bear in mind, this is a public podcast. I need to be careful what I say. Suffice to say that about six months in, it became apparent that Blackstone wasn't the organization for me and that I wasn't cut out to be a, a hard-nosed, aggressive investor. There's a reason why Blackstone is the most successful private equity fund on the planet, and that's because they are very strict in how they do deals. And I found that this wasn't well, how I wanted to operate, and so I resigned. Now, of course... Resigning from a job like that after you've only been in for eight months, when you're 45 now, I felt like another moment of, oh my God, I've done it a second time. I've suddenly found myself on a burning pier and nowhere to go. It was almost reliving the Mooshell MBO collapse, where out of good fortune, I'd been able to rebuild a career or restart my career with Thames. Here I was now, having let my ego run ahead of me and think that I could become an investor. Suddenly I found myself at 45 now going, oh dear, I'm out of a job again. And of course, it has an added bit of hubris which comes in here because thought I could do things. I thought I could make it as an investor and to fail and to actually elect to resign. You know, so I wasn't sacked. I went into the business. On, there was a particular deal that had happened, a meeting that had progressed in a way that I didn't like. And at the end of the meeting, there's quite a lot of high-fiving on our side as to, ha, ah, didn't that go well? And I came home and that evening I was telling my wife the story. And I suddenly thought, you know what? This isn't me. This isn't how I want to do business. And so the next day I went in and said, I'm sorry, I'm, this isn't for me. I'm out. And it was one of those moments where you find yourself thinking, this is either incredibly brave or fantastically stupid. Now, part of the reason I could do that was because, of course, by then, Isle, which had been bubbling away in the background, had now employed, I don't know, 15, 20 people. And Isle wasn't ever designed to be a sort of profitable business. It was just trying to support the water sector, trying to do things with innovation. And we were gradually growing. I was spending some time at the weekend or early in the morning or in the evenings, just supporting Isle and helping it, it do what it needed to do. So, sorry to cut you, but that means that by then, Isle had been somehow growing in the back. So it means that you were 100 person busy with something else. And when you had some free time, you were supporting the team, which was growing. So, and at that time, you have an opportunity to go full on time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's exactly it. It was quietly bubbling away. And if it made a profit, we either gave it to charity or we gave it back to the staff. Yeah, it was a lifestyle business. It wasn't, it was just ticking along in the background, hopefully doing good things for the water sector. And, you know, the aim of Isle was then and is still now. How do we make this technically brilliant industry that is is due to its structure naturally conservative and quite bureaucratic? How do we make the water sector better at 
identifying and adopting innovations that could make it a provide a better public health service to populations around the world. That was the driving force behind ISLE and is still the driving force behind ISLE. Anyway, so I then joined ISLE thinking, well, now it's suddenly got me and my salary and you know my need to actually make a living out of ISLE because I didn't draw any salary from it until then. Suddenly it got me and I thought, well, this is going to kill ISLE. And we, I was very lucky in that I found that actually it didn't kill Isle, and if, if anything, it, it sort of grew it. The key moment there <clears throat> is that it was at that point that I realised it had taken me 45 years to get there, but I realised that this is what I was meant to do. Running a small boutique technical consultancy is what I'm actually good at. It's what gives me energy. It's what gets me excited in the morning. I leap out of bed on a Monday morning thinking, hey, brilliant, we've got a week of work, which isn't quite how I'd ever felt when I was running the business in Atkins or Mooshell or in Thames. Yeah, there was that grind to it. And I wanted that excitement level of, man, thank God the weekend's over. Now we can get back to doing the real stuff. Yeah, you want that, that level of excitement, which I was very pleased to get. You're calling it boutique business, but if I now look seven years down the line, because that happens in 2015, where you go then yep. all in and full-time on Isle. So now we're in 2022. And if I count it about right on your website, it's about 100 headcounts right now at Isle. So the boutique has grown quite spectacularly. That's very nice of you to say so. Yes. Yeah, we've, we're about, I don't think it's over 100. I think we're just under 100 staff that are sort of full time on the salary. But there's obviously some consultants and people like that, that that work as needed. But the actual main staff body is probably just under 100 people. And we operate in lots of countries now. It's actually easier to say where we don't operate. So we don't operate in Japan, Russia, China, and India. And when I told a client that story a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, they said, oh, so do you operate in North Korea? And I was like, well, no, you're right. We don't operate in North Korea. So, 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 so there are places we don't operate in. But in general, we're in the Middle East. We're in Southeast Asia. We're in Australia. We're all across Europe. We're in Latin America and we're in North America. And it's 100 people. I still call it a boutique because what we do is still very specialist. So whilst we work with 350 utilities all around the world, the work we do is very specialist. It is all around innovation and strategy and benchmarking and how do you get better at those particular things. So we aren't ever going to be the broad, multidisciplined engineering consultancy business that that Atkins and Mooshell and Binnies and Stantec and Black and Veatch are. Yeah, we're always going to be very specialists. And that, I think, is why I call it a boutique consultancy. You give some numbers. So let's let's go to those numbers pretty yeah. swiftly. You give, you have, you're you working with 350 utilities. What I found as well is that you, you evaluated 11,000 technologies. And of those 11,000, 1,400 are approved or validated by your screening is that your your main activity and then have a follow-up on investment so 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 those numbers tend to change they get bigger i'm always surprised at how big they get so about a third of our business is running the tag program which is this sort of dragon's den engagement with water companies the other two thirds are specialist bespoke consultancy or running of trials, or doing investor due diligence, and all those sorts of things. So about a third of the business is around TAG. And it's through TAG that we have screened, indeed, you know, 10,000 plus technologies have gone through that screening process. Now, when we say approved, what that means is we tend to focus, imagine you're the chief executive of Sydney Water in Australia. You probably know the local universities and have some association with them. You don't know what's going on in Vancouver or in Atlanta or London because you just haven't got the bandwidth to engage at that level. So our job as Isle is to help you know which are the technologies which are being developed elsewhere around the world that might resonate with your business. Now, what you're mostly interested in are the later stage technologies, not the TRL, the technology readiness level one, two, three, four, five, but rather the technologies that are at six, seven, eight, nine. And so when we say we've looked at 10, 11,000 technologies, actually the ones which don't get approved are the early stage ones. It's not that they're not good because there's very few 
snake oil technologies in the water sector, mainly because if you were a crook and you wanted to develop a business that was just sort of fooling people and you were going to do it, you'd do it in a different industry. To be perfectly blunt, it's hard enough selling stuff into the water sector, even when your idea is brilliant, let alone trying to sell it. It's rubbish. So there's very few snake oil technologies in the water sector. Yeah, and by snake oil, I mean, you know, perpetual motion type machines, you know, things which the science just says, well, that's not going to work. In general, this is a technically brilliant very competent sector. So uh, when we look at those 11,000 technologies, many of them will be early stage and we tend to monitor them and see how they progress. And the ones which get put forward to a tag forum are the later stage ones. And the ones that then go under the approved bit are the ones which then get selected by the utilities themselves. So there's a second tier of due diligence. And we don't invest money. We are independent. I have to stress that we are independent. We don't own any intellectual property. We do not compete with any of the tech companies. But what we do is we do then facilitate those companies raising funding. And the last time we ran those numbers, which was probably two years ago, we found that it was over a billion dollars had been invested into the companies that we had facilitated through the tag process. When you're going, well, what's the metric you judge success by? I actually judge it by how many utilities are we talking to? How many utilities are engaged in this process? Because that's a that I think is the strongest metric of is what we're doing mattering to the industry. Where do you find those utilities? Because many people on, on that microphone have shared how that industry is quite special i think the typical sentence is the water industry is conservative for a reason and then everybody agrees on that and it seems to me like you're working with those 350 utilities which could be called maybe early adopters fast movers where do you find them and are they special i think there's probably 20,000 or more water utilities across the world. Actually, much more than that, because there's 55,000 just in North America alone. But they're very different. So the sort of clients we work for are the utilities that serve populations of sort of quarter of a million or more, because below that, there just isn't the scale. The organizations wouldn't have the bandwidth to be able to engage with us. You know, typically, we'd need to be talking to an asset director or a head of innovation. So that screens down the number of utilities we could talk to. Are they fast followers or sector leaders? No, in general, they're not. And that is because the way the water sector is designed and regulated for very good reason, I have to say, is to have a sort of very strong precautionary approach to life. You do not play fast and loose with people's public health. You don't suddenly say, hey, yeah, this was one way of treating water, but let's try a different way and run the risk of you know, poisoning 20,000 people. You just can't afford to do that. So, so this is a very heavily regulated sector, which for very good reason needs to operate in a very bureaucratic and quite thoughtful way before it adopts new innovation. The counter to that is that we desperately need new innovation. You know, the activated sludge process was invented in 1914. 1914. And bizarrely, we celebrated as an industry, we celebrated in 2014 that it was 100 years old. And I found myself thinking, are we seriously celebrating the fact that we've got this incredibly energy intensive treatment process? that we haven't changed for 100 years. I mean, that didn't feel like a moment to something to celebrate. A really interesting little anecdote, if I can just go off on a side story, is that Arden and Lockhart were the people who invented the activated sludge process. And they were essentially, Arden and Lockhart were the heads of research for the water companies that are now United Utilities and Thames Water, although those two companies didn't exist at the time. And I can't remember which one, I think it's Lockhart, in the 1950s when he was at the end of his life, he gave an interview and he talked about how radical the activated sludge process was. Because basically, if someone said to you, I've come up with a way of treating wastewater, what we're going to do is we're going to take some wastewater, we're going to blow air through it for a couple of days, then we're going to add more wastewater to it. And trust me, it's going to come out cleaner. I mean, you'd never, if someone described that to you, you'd never go, oh, yeah, now that sounds like an idea that's going to work. And, and he said on this sort of late in his life interview around how radical this idea was and how much 
people doubted it and didn't think it was going to happen. And so there's these moments where you get this sort of step change in innovation. And we do see it with other things. You know, more recently, I think thermal hydrolysis and the stuff that can be have done. In the late 90s, thermal hydrolysis was this sort of pressure cooking of sludge. How's that going to work? Now, of course, there's lots of people who are trying to copy them. Can be yeah, it's a really good technology. It's very robust and works, but it's, it was a game change in how things worked. And just finally, we do need this sort of innovation because just when you think it couldn't happen, you get something like Flint in North America where the lead poisoning and the work that Mona Hanna Atisha, I think her name is, you know, the pediatrician who spotted this and fought and she was incredibly brave. You know, she was an absolute star. The work she did to not give up, to keep rising the profile of this very challenging situation that just shouldn't have been happening in the second millennium. Just as you mentioned, Kembi, for anyone listening to that, have a year to season five, episode 14, where I'm having a conversation with the CEO of Kembi. So oh, we, we, I think he, he calls it the, the pressure cooker, a giant pressure cooker. So... That's a way to rationalize it. And I'm closing that parenthesis here because if not, I can take you for a long tangent because Sonico is something which you were involved with. <laughs> well, oh no, we've got to do the Sonico bit because I've already told the anecdote about how awful the name or how the name Isle came up. And Sonico, so I was head of research at Atkins I don't know, in my mid twenties and we invent this very in intense titanium vibrating horn, basically. It's a metal piece that vibrates, and by doing that, it causes cavitation, and the cavitation will disrupt cell walls. And uh, we were using it to enhance anaerobic digestion. And then Canby came along and just wiped the floor with us. Canby was a much, much better technology. It was more robust, it was cheaper, it was more reliable, it was just better. And we were leapfrogged. And Sonico, it's called Sonico because we had this thing called Sonics. And in all of the reference papers internally, we go, well, we've got to create a company here. Let's call it. And so for laziness, we just call it Sonics Co. while we were in these things. And then eventually that, because we were a bunch of engineers with no imagination, it, a Sonico became the name. Now, the twist in this is that when we launched it, we got quite a lot of hits on the website because we discovered that in Latin America, there is a certain female sexual toy, which is called Sonico. So we got quite a lot of... We got, Brilliant marketing. It was, well, it was marketing. Of course, when you talk about having a vibrating horn called Sonico, uh, it, you could understand the confusion that it created in the marketplace. Anyway, Sonico lived and died relatively briefly. It was... Like many technologies, you, know, you need to get overtaken by better ideas come up. And with hindsight, I look back and think, well, you know, we learned something. You mentioned technologies and you were saying a bit earlier that the water industry is a technology brilliant sector. And yet your tagline as Isle is that you want to be the catalyst in the water industry transformation. What is that transformation that we shall undergo as a sector? Thank you, because that's perhaps the most important thing I'd like to share today. Is, is the water sector is technically incredibly competent. We understand the science around things. We know what to do. The problem we've got is the rate of adoption. It is the fact that when a new technology is identified and we test it and we trial it and we get some data, we don't adopt it into our core business. It stays as a sort of glossy thing that we go, oh, now that was an interesting trial. Yes, maybe at some point in the future, we'll do another trial. And actually, the world is on fire. Yeah, you know, we've had three IPCC reports in the last 12 months that are just making it abundantly clear that this generation, if we do not respond on the climate crisis, this generation is going to be the one that will create an impossible situation for the next generation. So we have to introduce a sense of urgency around finding better ways to do things and then adopting them. Once we get comfortable that they know that they work, we adopt them. And that means we've got to challenge some of that very understandable resistance to new technology, which exists inside infrastructure businesses like the water sector. You explain how the resistance is strong because people might be dying. And that is what I often hear. And I'm just challenging that now because that's very true for drinking water. But drinking water is only 
one portion of the water industry. You have all the wastewater side, and then you have all the industry water side, and then you have all the agricultural water, which is the part we never talk about in the water industry. So is there maybe a part, I mean, it's like if you're, you have to climb the Everest, and there's many ways to climb the Mount Everest, and there is the north phase, which is the most difficult one, yeah, yeah. and then you can maybe go from the south. It's still going to be difficult, but it's going to be more doable. Does that metaphor somehow hold water in the water industry? It does. It does. Absolutely. However, I would just challenge you on one thing. So we say, I obviously use the example that you don't want to poison people. You don't want to put, you know, and that's a very extreme example. Perhaps I think the worst thing a water company can do, and I say this as the former asset director at Thames Water, one of the worst things a water company can do to its customers is flood their houses with sewage. And actually, that happens with a frightening amount of, you know, sewer flooding is far worse, I think, than a drought, because getting someone else's fecal matter coming into your house is a horrible experience. I'm not suggesting that not having water supply isn't a nice one, but ju but you can't make the assumption that you can take more risk on wastewater assets than you can on drinking water assets, because the consequences of things going wrong are still catastrophic and very impactful on people's lives. That said, your analogy around the many faces of Everest is exactly right. There are lots of ways in which innovation in the water sector can be, the rate at which it can be tested and adopted can be enhanced from where we traditionally start. And that does mean you've got to have forward-thinking utilities who are open-minded to taking maybe a slightly different risk profile on, on what they do. You also need regulators who are open-minded to maybe having some flexibility in the regulations. There's no point in saying, I want you to meet this regulatory standard, and the only solution is using an old form of technology. If someone's going to be bold enough, if a utility is going to be bold enough to try a new solution, you actually need the regulator to come with you on that journey to understand that if it doesn't work, Maybe they won't prosecute in the way that they would have done had someone tried an old and tested uh, method. There is one thing that I think is worth saying. In the water sector, there are two things that are brilliant about the water sector. Well, there are many things that are brilliant about the water sector, but there are two in particular that I love about the water sector. The first is that water companies love to share. You know, they absolutely love to share. This isn't like working in pharmaceuticals, whereas if you manage to get GlaxoSmithKline developing a new drug, they're going to keep it secret and they're not going to tell anyone. In the water sector, if someone tries something new and it works, they will love to tell everybody about it. And that means you get this cascading of learning around the world. The second brilliant thing about the water sector is that it is a global market. So if you come up with a way of resolving leakage or better cleaning up biomethane or better managing the watersheds. You know, the market for that isn't just localised around London, but it will apply in Sydney, Australia, in Guatemala, in Central Africa. You know, the technologies in general cascade to a global market, which means that if you're an innovator and an entrepreneur, if you can come up with a compelling solution, and you can test it with a utility who's prepared to tell the world about it. You've got a big market that can open up quite quickly for you. And that's a brilliant place to be. So if there are challenges because climate change is here to stay, because we are still relying on technologies which are one century old and which are our workhorses, if there is this potential to, on the long run, being quite successful because once your technology is validated then the word is yours that means that you have to concentrate on this step in between which is this adoption of the new technology and you mentioned how rate of adoption is a difficult thing in that industry how do you overcome that and what are you doing as isle to help companies overcome that i think the name is chasm crossing the yeah, chasm no chasm you're absolutely right so we launched a initiative called the trial reservoir at the end of last year And the reservoir, it's a reservoir of money. It's basically a pot of money that we have given to the water sector. And it is to fund trials. But the big, the really key thing here is that funding is only allowed, is only gifted if the utility agrees to adopt the technology if the trial is successful. 
So imagine a scenario, you're an entrepreneur, you've got a utility you're talking to, you're talking about doing a trial. And traditionally, what normally happens is you do a trial and everybody goes, well, that was interesting data. Yeah, let's think about it. and We'll come back to this in six months time. And then they'll do another trial and then they'll do another trial and then they'll do another trial. You get caught in this sort of groundhog day of doing trials. What we're saying is, you know, we will fund the trial. We will take 100 percent of the risk on the trial. So if the trial fails, there's no comeback on the utility and there's no comeback on the entrepreneur. We as Isle will take 100% of the risk on the trial failing. However, if the trial works, then actually the utility will adopt it. And that means the utility then has to think about, well, actually, if I'm going to adopt it, what do I need to see from this trial? You get into much more thoughtful trial design around what would be my no regrets outcome? What would make me excited about this trial such that I'm confident enough to mean I'm prepared to adopt this technology? And now if the trial is successful, then obviously the utility buys the technology and the technology company then pays back the loan we've given them, pays back money into the reservoir. So the money flows, that's why it's called a reservoir, the money flows in and out. And the aim is that we have this pot of money that could be used multiple times, hundreds of times, the same money could be used to fund trial after trial with different companies and all the time driving forward this adoption of technology. We launched it in November. We've had over 100 applications which we're working through. We've got over half a dozen trials now operating in North America, Europe, Central Africa, Australia. We've, it's just absolutely wonderful. Can you give us an example from one of these um, ongoing trials? Yeah, so, so there's, well, there's two. Can I give you two examples? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's one in Africa, which is around, it's around intelligent water supply. So typically the carbon footprint in rural places in Africa, the carbon footprint around water goes up because people get contaminated water sources and then they have to chop down trees to boil the water to make it safe. So this is a technology that's providing low carbon footprint, but clean water but it's basically a clever tap, a smart tap, where you can tap it with your RFID token and it will then discharge a pre-bought amount of water into a, a canister. So the, the family member can go there with their canister and the tag, they tap the tap, they turn it on, they can extract their 10 litres of clean water, safe in the knowledge that they then don't need to start chopping down firewood to, to boil it. And it's a great technology, e-water services, and we are funding a couple of new pipes, new taps in a new area to see what impact that could be. What's the metric you follow there to say, if we meet that, then it's going to be yeah. adopted? So, so every trial has slightly different metrics. I think on that one, it's actually a minimum number of people in each of the areas. Every time you install one of these taps, it's got to sort of have a minimum community that it serves. Although, to be honest, for the trial reservoir's key metric is how much carbon are we alleviating? That's... When I'm on my deathbed and someone says to me, are you proud of the trial reservoir? I'll be going, yes, we achieved this much carbon mitigation. And the second one is jumping to the UK. We've got a technology called Orage, which is a French technology for sludge thickening. And they are doing a trial with Yorkshire water. And the beauty of that was it was a relatively small trial. It was about $50,000 cost in trial. And the commitment they'd made was that they were going to buy one of these dewatering units, if the trial was successful, they'd buy one of these dewatering units, which was about a quarter of a million in cost. And the trial was designed to be six weeks long. And within three weeks of it starting, they were already talking about how could they buy four of these units because the results were so good. And the thing that happened there was that because we were forcing the utility to think about what would they do if they adopted it, it meant that there were more senior people engaged in, in the company looking at the trial and going, well, hell, if this thing does what it says it's going to do, we need to adopt it, not in six months' time. We need to adopt it today. And that was an incredibly powerful moment. So the trial reservoir isn't really about a pot of money. It's about a culture change. It's about trying to ensure that that, that thought process that, that I think is necessary at a senior level inside utilities to drive forward adoption is actually happening. Sorry to take you down to the nitty gritty details, but you mentioned how Isle is taking 100% of the risk. And I do get that it's an awesome metric to say how much carbon you've saved by the end of the process. And there should be no end because it's an evergreen process. But where do you take your own share of that bucket? Because you need to live from something. 
So, well, we do, but we have our core business for that. So the trial reservoir was a gift that we made. I have to say, I was quite surprised when my shareholders, when I took it to my shareholders and said, I want to take 25% of our profits and put them into this reservoir. We'd always given 25% of our profits, had always given to either to charity or to entrepreneurs working in the water and sanitation space. And last year I said, look, this year I don't want to do that. This year I want to put in the trial reservoir. Are we okay with that? And I got a hell yes from our shareholders. And so we launched this initiative. And I have had people say to me, one person said to me, well, if you do 10 trials and they're all successful, then the trial reservoir is going to grow. What are you going to do then? It was like, well, we're going to invest in even more trials. Uh, you know, that's great. And, and actually, if we did invest in 10 trials and we found them all to be successful, that would suggest that we weren't drawing the risk line in the right place. We weren't taking enough risk because, of course, I don't want the trials to fail. But equally, if everything we do is a success, it means we're probably not being innovative enough. We're probably not taking enough risk. So I do actually want to. And I've got to be careful saying that because what I don't want to be is have a whole bunch of nutters coming to me going, well, I've got a trial that will definitely fail. Why don't you fund this one? Because that clearly isn't where we're where we're trying to take this concept. But uh, yeah, that's where we're at. at the moment. It's still early days. We've got, like I said, we've got a very healthy pipeline of opportunities, very healthy hundreds, over 100 technologies from all around the world. And the bit I love is it's they're in municipal and industrial. They're in low, medium and high income countries. It's just wonderful. It's a wonderful initiative. To compare it to what we discussed a bit earlier about this, these timelines in the water industry and how we are somehow doomed to accept our fate of being a quite sensitive industry. If I take your example, you just shared of this Orage pilots, where within three months you go from pilots three weeks. to... Three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, sorry, it's even faster. So th three weeks you go from pilots to possibly selling for units. Usually, if you look at the timelines in the industry between piloting and being in those three to five first references, it takes almost a decade. Oh, I think you're being unreasonable there. No, it takes much longer than a decade. To get the first references, not to be in the middle <laughs> I, of the market. I, I was being <laughs> fatuous. You know, typically, I used to joke when we were in Sonico, of, well, maybe if we could get this sale, then maybe my children might be able to get the second sale through in a generation's time. And actually, if you look at Canby, let's just go back to Canby. You know, Canby came onto the market pretty much fully formed in 1998, 1999. You know, the technology they had, okay, it needed some refining, but it wasn't, it was well formed, yet it's taken two decades to get to it being fully recognized. It's, it's, it's a very long time for these things to fall into place. It's a topic we've been discussing on that microphone with Andrew Benedek with the example of Zenon, which is mm -hmm. the perfect example of how long it takes and which Paul O'Callaghan has been like, putting into a theory and a thesis, which we also discussed on that microphone. So I'll link to that in the show notes. But I have a question on that one, which is you're taking all the risk. And by doing that, you're very successful. And I'm oversimplifying it right now and quite a lot, because as you explained, the real trick is not taking out the risk, is having the right stakeholders on the table very early on and deciding on what is going to be success and then executing on that success. If I now compare it to the business model, which is quite growing now in North America of water as a service, wastewater as a service, basically they do exactly the same. They come, they say, hey, you don't have any capital to put down. We do it for you. You look at it and the risk you take is two, three months of, of fees. And in worst case scenario, it doesn't work and we just leave forever. And there, the adoption is faster than conventional, but still not to the extent you're describing here. So to me, the difference is you have a third party, which is ISLE, which is saying that technology is not only risk-free, it's also approved. And we have a track record of technologies we've approved. And we reviewed it with our external eye and we think it might be a good match. So is that the secret sauce? Well, yes, it is. Although I'd say the reason I'm, the way I manage the risk in the trial reservoir, and perhaps this comes back to my learnings from my Blackstone days, is it's all around the due diligence that you're doing and focusing your due diligence on the right things. And you often see investors looking and they'll spend lots of time and effort and money doing due diligence before they make an investment. But I tend to think they spend it looking at answering the wrong questions. And for a trial reservoir trial, there are really only three things that we need to look at when we're doing our due diligence. So the first is, does the technology work? 
you know, is it snake oil? Is it a perpetual motion machine? Or does it actually do what it says it's going to do on the tin? Now, that is, of course, IELTS core business. So if we don't know the answer to that, then we deserve to fail, you know, quite simply. The second bit of due diligence is, has the trial been designed to be reasonable? You know, it might be there's a technology that is brilliant, but the trial has been designed to be so unreasonably ambitious that no matter how good the technology is, it's never going to achieve the goals. Well, that's a really useful thing to have flushed out in the conversation with the client. But equally, if the trial is unrealistic, you have to walk away. And again, that's relatively straightforward to diligence. It's relatively straightforward to get your head around what's the risk here. It's not always going to work, but you can minimize down the risks of failure by clever trial design or sensible trial design. The third and most important bit of due diligence is actually on the utility. It's on the end user. Is the person at the end user utility, is it someone who actually has the budgetary authority? Do they actually have the, the full understanding and the authority to make the commitment that's being made, i.e., if this trial is a success, they are going to do something meaningful, which is probably by the technology. And that is the most important bit of the due diligence, actually, is just making sure that the person in the utility isn't suddenly going to go, oh, no, I've still got to pass this by my boss. I've still got to get it through procurement. I've still got to you know, put it through. And we try and do all of that work before the trial begins, all of that ensuring that you're compliant with all the procurement rules and all of the asset standards and operational requirements, and that all of that gets dealt with before the trial begins. And that's the most important bit of due diligence. And of course, once you've got a well-meaning and informed buyer, you've got a sensibly designed trial working with a technology that you know should work, actually, it's a relatively low bet. Yeah, the risk level isn't, I'm not saying the risk level zero, because it clearly isn't, but the risk level begins to be something that is bankable. Well, that's fascinating. And I'm getting frustrated because I could take you one more hour on the topic. Like, why do we need IELTS to do that? Isn't that supposed to be something that governments shall be doing themselves? But I don't want to open a sidetrack here. And I don't know. I'm, so, I will get you frustrated say, because I, I'm 52. And I've got, I don't know, 15 years left probably in this water sector. And I have decided that I'm going to commit those 15 years to trying to make it so that the trial reservoir concept is something that begins, that becomes um, endemic everywhere. It becomes the way that we do trials because it strikes me as this is such an obvious model for how innovation should be adopted, not just in the water sector, but in the energy and transport and all sorts of, in particular, in sectors where they're infrastructure heavy and the adoption of innovation is a cumbersome process. Actually, it's the definition of a brilliant idea. It's when you hear it, you're like, that's obvious. But you had to have the idea first. And that's exactly how when Sivan Zemir mentioned the trial reservoir on that microphone, it was like, that is exactly what we needed. And it's so awesome to see that well, actually you did it. So. Well, can I tell you, can we finish? I know that you wanted this to be 45 minutes long and we're over no, now. Don't worry. I'm conscious of your time. Mine doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me finish with a little anecdote as to how the trial reservoir idea came about. So it was last summer. About a year ago, I was on holiday with my family in the Yorkshire Dales, and I was there with my brother. My brother's very senior at Orsted, the offshore wind farm people. And it was the day that the first IPCC report came out that basically said the world's on fire and we're all screwed. And we were walking in the Yorkshire Moors and, and going, well, we're both quite senior people in the environmental sector. And this feels overwhelming for us. Imagine what it feels like if you're not in a senior position. How the hell are we going to resolve this problem? And that evening we went to an Italian restaurant in, in Yorkshire. And I'm normally a two beers man. I have two beers and then I'm in my sort of happy place. And for some reason that night I had three beers and I never drink coffee. And at the end of the meal... The waiter came around and said, who'd like a coffee? And I was like, yeah, I'll have a coffee. And so what it meant was that night I was lying in bed with a little bit more alcohol than normal and a lot more caffeine than normal coursing through my veins. And I was wrestling with this IPCC report, climate change, how can we resolve it? And I swear to you, the idea of the trial reservoir pretty much came to me fully formed at 3 a.m. that morning, I was so excited. I woke my wife up, who to this day still doesn't show the right level of excitement about the trial reservoir. She wasn't very amused at 3 a.m. that morning, but it was 
And it was one of those ideas where you know how you have these things in the middle of the night and you think they're terribly brilliant. And then when you wake up in the morning, you can't quite remember what the idea was and you can't quite remember. And it never feels quite as good the following day. On this occasion, when I woke up in the morning, it was still, this is how the industry could do it. This is how it could happen. And the key moment being, someone needs to seed it. Someone needs to give a pot of money to the industry. And that was then led me to me talking to our shareholders saying, hell, we're going to put, we're going to put the money in. It's our money that we're going to put at risk here. Time will tell whether it's a mad idea or whether it's a good one, but yeah, we will see. You're right. Time will tell. If I was to take a bet, to me, it's obvious that it's a good idea and you never know what happens, but yeah, I stand my case. That is one of the most brilliant things I've heard ever. And I'm really happy to see how that develops. And honestly, and that's why I'm frustrated, I would dive much deeper into it but i'd be really happy to have you uh, next time to to have a follow-up on how that developed how does the evergreen funding allow you to go to even more places and cover even more technologies and even more fields but i'll keep that for the next time you, you're on for today i propose you to switch to the rapid fire questions to okay. round up right. that yep. discussion It's time for the rapid fire questions. So in that last section, I'll have short questions, which aim for short answers, but I'm never cutting the microphone. The first one is, what is the most exciting project you've been working on and why? Oh, trial reservoir because it will save the planet. I felt like there, there was a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Can you name one thing that you've learned the hard way? Oh, yeah. The learning that I am not, I'm not someone, yeah, my career at the beginning was that I, my my aspiration was that my career would be that I'd be some big chief executive of a big company and I'd be the big I am. And I literally you know, spent 20 years progressing a career path that could, had luck gone in a different way, have led me to that role. But I think I'd be miserable in it. I genuinely think I'd A, be a terrible chief executive of a big organization and B, I'd be miserable. I wouldn't enjoy it. I'd get up on a Monday morning thinking, oh, God, here we go again. And that is not a way to live life. Is there something you are doing in your job today that you will not be doing in 10 years? Yeah, quite. <laughs> so we've just recently appointed a, so as Isles grown, it's getting to 100 people meant that yeah, once you get to a certain scale, you have to do a bit of management. And I'm not a manager, as you've probably become blindingly obvious in this interview. So I appointed a chief executive last year in Isle, a chap called uh, Dr. Ben Tam. He's absolutely exceptional. And it means that I'm getting less and less involved in the things I'm not good at, which is the administration around running a business. And I look forward to 10 years time where I have zero responsibilities for doing that. By the way, you mentioned the 100 people roughly at Isle. What I found amazing on your website is that there's a biography for every single person working at Isle. Usually you get the story of the founder, the story of the CEO, sometimes of the board. Here it's everybody because it sounds like everybody has to be one of the parts of that bigger impact. So I found it really... That feels like this, just the sort of thing that Ben Tan would have sorted out for us because I certainly had no involvement in ensuring that happened. <laughs> What is the trend to watch out for in the water sector? So there's all the obvious ones that people talk about, which is you know, around digitization and such like. I think the trend will be towards, I think atmospheric water generation is something that we're going to see more of over the next 25 years. That's an interesting one, but not opening a sidetrack again, because there's strong proponents and strong opponents. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's a good sign, usually, that you're onto something when people have so strong opinions. If you were a world political leader, what would be your first action to influence the fate of the world's water challenges? So I would, I would try and install the model that they've got in Welsh water in Wales with Welsh water. So I'm not a huge fan of privatization. I don't think I think privatization works for 20, 30 years, but it then, as we're seeing in the UK, it begins to get very tired. And it becomes very difficult to match the aspirations of the investors with the performance that's required for the public. Of course, the reason you do privatization is because you need a cash injection into the infrastructure to enable you to improve the assets that are there. 
So it's not a black and white conversation, but I'd love to see a world where you had the sort of attitude and behaviours that we see in Dwyer Cymru or Welsh Water uh, as a sort of not-for-profit yet privatised type entity. And finally, last question. Would you have someone to recommend me that I should definitely invite as soon as possible on that same microphone? Yeah. I, so I met Jim Bentley. Jim Bentley is spectacular. He used to be the managing director of Hunter Water in, in Australia. It's an area of Newcastle, serves Newcastle, about 100 miles north of Sydney. And he's he's got this wonderful background. And he is one of the most principled people I've ever met in the water sector. And he's spectacular. I would strongly recommend talking to him. Pierce, I have to say, had really high expectations for that discussion. And uh, you went far beyond those expectations. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. If people want to follow up with you after that interview, where shall I redirect them the best? So you can either go to our website, www.ileutilities.com or email me at peers.clark at ileutilities.com. And it's peers, P-I-E-R-S, and it's Clark, C-L-A-R-K, and it's ileutilities, ending I-E-S, not Y-S at the end. So in case you didn't have something to write on right now, don't worry. Everything is in the show notes. You'll have the links to, to the website and to, to your email. Pierce, thanks a lot. And I hope to have that follow-up with you at some point in the future. I look forward to it. It was wonderful speaking with you. Thank you very much.